From New Hampshire Public Radio, I'm Laura Canoy, and this is The Exchange. Welcome to another in our series of Rudman Center Conversations with the Candidates, coming to you from the Rudman Center at UNH School of Law. Our guest tonight is New Hampshire U.S. Senator Jean Shaheen, a Democrat finishing her first term. Next week, we'll talk with Republican Frank Ginta of the 1st Congressional District. I'd also like to thank our sponsors of this series, Eastern Bank and Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. Throughout the hour, we'll be sharing questions we receive from our listeners before this event, and we'll take questions from our audience here at the Rudman Center. And Senator Shaheen, welcome. Thanks for your time. We really appreciate it. It's great to be with you. and. Thank you to NHPR and the Redmond Center for sponsoring this conversation. Well, there's five more to go after this one. People can check out the schedule on our website, nhpr.org. Senator Sheen, I do want to jump right into national security. There's been a lot of reaction this week to President Obama's statement that the intelligence community underestimated the militant group ISIS and overestimated the capacity of the Iraqi army to hold ISIS back. And while a lot of people have been criticizing the president, I want to ask you about the Senate's role Members of the 9-11 Commission said Congress is partly to blame for the rise of ISIS. Members didn't take the threat seriously enough. You're a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. When were you first made aware of this group? And did you and the committee not take it seriously enough at first? You know, I think everyone takes the threat of terrorism seriously. And as we saw here in New Hampshire so dramatically with the barbarous murders of Jim Foley and Stephen Sotloff, um, this is a group that is particularly barbarous, um, that doesn't seem to know any boundaries when it comes to um, treating people decently. And I think that really brought home to everyone here in New Hampshire and really to America just how big a threat this group is and the need to respond to it. When did you first start hearing talk about uh, ISIS Senator Shaheen and the idea that this wasn't uh, the JV team, as some called it early on? Um, you know, I think those of us became in the Senate and I assume in the House became aware of it sometime last year. Um, I, I've had 16 briefings, hearings, um, classified um, meetings where we've discussed ISIS and other terrorist groups, uh, events in Iraq and Syria. So this is something that people have been hearing about for a while, and I think it's something that it's very clear we need to respond to. About a year ago, the U.S. was contemplating military action against the regime of Syrian President Assad, uh, whose slaughter of his own people has just shocked everyone. It's, it defies imagination what's happened there. Now, given the American airstrikes against ISIS in Syria, there's fear that the U.S. is actually helping Assad out. The New York Times called this dangerous and morally troubling. What do you think, Senator Shaheen? Are you worried that the U.S. role in the Syrian civil war will strengthen the Assad regime? Well, as you began um, a little over a year ago, it became clear that Assad had chemical weapons and that he was using them on the Syrian people. And I was one of 10 on the Foreign Relations Committee who voted to take military action in Syria to address those chemical weapons. I think it was that action that actually produced an international response that Russia and the United States reached an agreement that with Syria to remove those chemical weapons, I think that was very important because that means that now ISIS doesn't have access to those chemical weapons. Um, but we clearly need to act to address this threat and we, I think forming an international coalition is important to do that and including Arab countries, Muslim states, and that international coalition is very important. And as we've heard, the immediate threat is from ISIS. We can't get at the, their headquarters of operations unless we go into Syria. And I think it's important that we're seeing Arab countries be part of that action. So how do we avoid helping out Assad as we go after ISIS? I mean, it would seem it would be helping him by knocking down uh, ISIS. Uh, from what I understand, some of the more moderate rebel groups are worried that 
they may be hurt in this process as well. Uh, well, that's why we're vetting those Syrian opposition groups so that they're, they don't have ties to either Assad or to other terrorist organizations. Um, but I think the immediate threat is from ISIS, and um, you know, we need to address that, and we need to take it on in the ways that America has outlined, both with building an international coalition, with taking on their financing, as, as has been reported, this is the best financed terrorist organization we've ever seen, and some of the airstrikes in the last week have knocked out some of their oil operations, which is very important because that's where a lot of their funding is coming from. I think we also need to go at their recruitment efforts, and that's part of um, the plan that's underway now, and provide support for those Syrians who have been vetted, who we're going to be helping to train and equip, and the Iraqis, so that they are the boots on the ground in combat fighting against ISIS. What about boots on the ground, Senator Shaheen? I'm glad you used that phrase. How do you feel about the prospect of American boots on the ground? This is a big debate. I, I think Americans don't want to see us send tens of thousands of troops back into Iraq to be an occupying force. I think this is their country. Um, they should provide the men and women who are going to be fighting um, this terrorist organization. I think we can support them and the airstrikes and the efforts to um, provide assistance to their um, army as they're fighting ISIS is important for us to do, but I'm not willing to send tens of thousands of troops back into Iraq. Here's a tweet that came from Brett, and Brett, thank you for this. He says, given that ISIL, that's the other term that people often use for this group, poses no immediate threat to the U.S., Brett says, why vote for preemptive aggression? Thanks, Brett, for the comment. Um, because I think they do pose a long-term threat to the United States to have a, a caliphate across the Middle East where they are adding um, Muslims and terrorists on a regular basis is not something that I think the United States wants to see. And if you have any question about the terrorist threat they pose, look at the murders of Jim Foley and Stephen Sotloff. Some of your fellow Democrats, Senator Shaheen, have said that they're worried about the administration's action in Syria and Iraq not become another open-ended conflict, as you said, tens of thousands of American soldiers going back, and that we might be arming extremists who will eventually use those weapons against us. How much do you share those concerns that we say we're vetting these groups and we're arming the so-called good guys, but a lot of the time we don't really know or we're being deceived? Well, there aren't any great options here. And I think not addressing this terrorist threat poses more of a concern than taking action to address them. I do believe that before we commit to a multi-year open-ended effort, however, we need to have a debate in Congress uh, about whether we're going to provide the authorization for use of military force. I have called on the President to come to Congress and request that so that we have a debate about it. If he doesn't do that, I think Congress needs to move forward without, without his request and um, have that debate. We owe it to the people of this country. We owe it to the men and women serving in uniform to have a robust debate about this issue. Let's talk about energy, Senator Shaheen. That's been a big issue of yours in the Senate. There was a huge climate change rally and a United Nations meeting this week, in, excuse me, last week in New York City. This has gotten a lot of coverage, tons and tons of people filling the streets of New York, promises made by world leaders. You've called addressing climate change a moral obligation. That's a big statement. What big approaches do you think Congress should take to address this? Addressing our energy future is a national security imperative, it's an economic imperative, but it's also an environmental imperative. And as we saw from those demonstrators, as we've heard from scientists all over the world, um, our climate is changing and fossil fuels are contributing to that. And so we've got to take a look at what we can do to address fossil fuels and our dependence on them. You know, here in New Hampshire, we're seeing 
already the effects of climate change. We're seeing it in terms of our snowfall. We're, we've got less snowfall over the last 30 years. Um, we were seeing it in an earlier ice out on our With lakes. With the exception of last winter, which was, right, right. I remember doing a lot of shoveling myself. But. Well, and, you know, one of, one of the, um, simp one of the things we see with climate change is that there are dramatic ups and downs. So what we see in New Hampshire is more dramatic weather events. We see flooding. We see an impact on maple sugaring industry. You know, one of the things that I don't know if anybody saw um, the story in the paper over the weekend about the moose festival and the attraction of our moose for tourists coming to the state. but. We're seeing a decline in the moose population that's very dramatic, 40 to 50 percent, and also a, chain, a decline in other forms of wildlife here. It's affecting hunting. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why we should be concerned about this, and we need to think about how we can take action. One of the challenges in Washington has been trying to get an agreement from those people who support alternative sources of energy, new energy technologies, and those who support fossil fuels. And my way of addressing that has been to find a partner to work with me on energy efficiency. Rob Portman. Rob Portman, Republican from Ohio. Because energy efficiency is the cheapest, fastest way to deal with our energy needs. And we have a bill that is a comprehensive strategy to address energy efficiency. It deals with the building sector, with the manufacturing sector where we use most of our energy. In the building sector, we use about 40 percent of our energy. And the federal government, where we are the biggest user of energy in the federal government. And the military uses about 93 percent of that energy. So our legislation, according to the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, if we could pass it this year, would save consumers over $16 billion a year, would help create about 200,000 jobs by 2030, and be the equivalent of taking 22 million cars off the road. So there is tremendous savings in this approach. When I was governor, I worked on this. We did something called the, we started retrofitting state buildings for energy efficiency. And now we're saving between two and $4 million a year on the state's energy bill and thousands of pounds of pollution. We heard some pretty drastic predictions at the climate conference um, in New York. I wonder, energy efficiency is great, but given the dramatic nature of the threats that we're said to face, do politicians like yourself need to act more boldly beyond well, retrofitting buildings? Well, I think we need buildings? to act, and I think energy efficiency is an approach where we can get some agreement to do that. And, you know, don't underestimate the potential for energy efficiency because... One of my favorite statistics is that in the last 40 years, we have saved more energy through efficiency in the United States than we have produced through fossil fuels and nuclear power combined. So there is tremendous potential here. Is it all that we need to do? No, of course not. Um, we need to look at fuel efficiency standards um, for our automobiles. We need to look at where we can transition off of fossil fuels to new energy technologies. But we have a number of businesses in New Hampshire that show tremendous potential to address energy, our energy needs. I, I visited a company up in Warner called Warner Power, which has developed the first um, new innovation in transformers that are used in, you know, buildings in 100 years called a hexaformer. And so there are those kinds of innovations that are going to help us deal with our energy use. What about a carbon tax? That's a solution preferred by many environmental groups. Well, I haven't supported a carbon tax, despite what people may have heard from my opponent and other sources. Um, and in fact, if, if we look at the, the new clean energy plan that has come from uh, EPA, because of the actions that we've taken here over a period of years through the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and other efforts to save energy, we are on track to be able to um, meet the standards that they have set for New Hampshire. So I think that's very positive and it shows that there are a number of different ways that we can achieve this, the energy savings we need to meet the, 
the reductions in carbon. I want to ask you another question about um, Shaheen Portman. Again, that's your energy efficiency bill. It's been tied up, as you suggested, in Capitol Hill politics. There's been this issue of amendments and whether it can come to the floor and what Senator Reid is doing, the majority leader, and, and so forth. But your opponent, Senator Shaheen, point to this bill as a, an indication of a lack of effectiveness on your part. Here we have this non-controversial piece of legislation. A lot of people are behind energy efficiency. Uh, so they say, hey, why can't you get this through? This is this is easy. This is cake. How do you say, what do you say to that, Senator Shaheen, that this is a measure of your effectiveness and not a very good one? Well, that's especially ironic coming from my opponent who lobbied to try and kill my bill with his Republican colleagues. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's very real. And the fact is, I think we are going to get this bill through. Um, after the election, we have support from over 260 groups, everybody from the American Chemistry Council to the National Resources Defense Council to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to um, union groups. So this is a bill that has broad support, broad bipartisan support, and I believe we're going to get it back to the floor and pass it. How should we as voters measure lawmaker effectiveness? I mean, is it bills passed? Is it votes you take? Is it, you know, hearings that, that you attend? How do we measure what you guys are doing down there? I think it's all of the above. I think it's, you know, I go to Washington. Um, I get up every day thinking about what do I need to do to support New Hampshire? What's going to be good for this state? What's going to be good for my constituents? And that's what I think about when I'm taking votes. Um, that's what I think about as I look at the work we're doing um, on pieces of legislation. And you know, I think that that's ultimately what people will make a decision about. Who do they think best represents the interests of the state? And that's something else that your opponent has brought up, Senator Shaheen, that you vote with the president pretty much down the line. He's got the 99 percent of the time. Um, I don't know if it's exactly 99 percent, but we've checked it. It's close. Is it a legitimate point, Senator Shaheen, that the Granite State should be able to expect a more independent stance from its senator, that you shouldn't be marching with the president all the time if you're really representing the people of New Hampshire? Well, you know, there are a lot of surveys in Washington. He cites um, one to get to that statistic. But I think what people need to do is to look at what I've done in Washington, look at what I've done in New Hampshire, and make a decision based on whether or not I've been effective. And if you look at um, my work in a bipartisan way, whether it's with Rob Portman on energy efficiency, whether it's with Senator Ayotte, our work to address um, ben benefits for veterans and their access to health care, where we were able to get um, something that has been worked on for years in New Hampshire, and that is to get veterans access to care um, close to home without having to go to Vermont or to Massachusetts. That's been a big issue in New Hampshire, care. yeah. You know, the first bill I filed when I got to Washington was for a full service veterans hospital or equivalent care. And because of the legislation that just passed to reform the Veterans Administration, Senator Ayotte and I worked closely together and we got a provision in that said any state without a full service veterans hospital if veterans live further than 20 miles away from a full-service veterans hospital, they can go to their local provider and get the care they need. So that changes what has been true for decades in New Hampshire of our veterans having to travel hours and long distances to get the care they need. So I think it's looking at those efforts to work together to find um, how partners in one what I'm trying to do and what we need to accomplish that I'm very proud of. All right. Well, more conversation with New Hampshire U.S. Senator Jean Shaheen in just a moment. And we'll continue to take questions from our live audience here. This is The Exchange on NHPR. This is The Exchange on NHPR. Welcome back to our series of Rudman Center Conversations with the Candidates at UNH School of Law. Our candidate is New Hampshire Democratic U.S. Senator Jean Shaheen. And Senator Shaheen, just to wrap up what we were talking about before the break, the critique that you vote too often with President Obama, um, when is President Obama wrong? When have you felt, as a Democrat, you know, I wish he wouldn't do that? 
Well, I certainly disagree with them on efforts to get an internet sales tax through. I don't think that's good for New Hampshire, and ultimately I don't think it's good in terms of job creation. Um, I also disagreed with him in terms of the proposal that has twice been submitted to the Senate to do another round of base closing. You know, I chair the Readiness Subcommittee, Senator Ayotte's the ranking member of the Readiness Subcommittee of the Armed Services Committee. And any effort for another round of base closing has to go through our subcommittee and ultimately through the Armed Services Committee. And I have been very clear that um, unless we get better answers, there is no way we're going to do another round of base closing. So those are a couple. I, I also don't agree with his proposal for chain CPI, which is another way to look at cost of living increases for Social Security. I don't think we ought to be balancing the budget on the backs of our seniors. So there are a number of areas, and I, I've been very willing to stand up to the President and say, I, I don't think this is right. What about the Affordable Care Act, uh, Senator Shaheen? You have called this a good first step, but said it needs more work. Just very specifically, what more work does it need? Well. Let me begin by saying I think it's really important for people in New Hampshire and across this country to have access to affordable, quality health care. And as I have traveled around New Hampshire in the last year, I have heard from people all over the state who have benefited by the Affordable Care Act. I was just in Laconia earlier today, and I heard from um, somebody who attended our event. Actually, it was a reporter who told me that he had had cancer 16 years ago. And because of that pre-existing condition, he was paying over $800 a month for his health insurance coverage. And he said, now because of the Affordable Care Act, I don't have to worry about that anymore. So is there more we need to do? Absolutely. When you implement that big a change, there are fixes that you have to do as you see how it gets implemented and what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. For example, One of what those things yeah. is the medical device tax. I think as we look at New Hampshire, where we have a number of medical device companies, as we look at the country, that's an industry that um, requires a lot of innovation, where we're seeing a lot of change occur, and I don't think we want to depress that kind of innovation. So I think we've got to take a look at at whether we're going to continue that. I have sponsored legislation that would repeal that provision. I think we need to look at, and I argued that we needed to extend the time period before phasing in the law for small businesses so that we had some more data, so that we knew what was working better, um, and we did that. I have um, filed legislation that would create an independent advisory board and an independent CEO over the website um, for the marketplace. Oh, because they had I such think trouble in the beginning. That's right. And, and while it's gotten better, I still think we need some independent oversight for that. If you get rid of the medical device tax, where would the money come from to fill that hole? I mean, nobody wants to pay. Everybody wants the benefits, but nobody wants to pay sure. for them. Well, and one of the things that we're seeing, which is a benefit and again, as we get more data, we'll have a better idea. But we're seeing that health care costs actually have flattened as the result of the health care law. Um, and to what extent that's been the result of the changes from the Affordable Care Act, to what extent the economy contributed to that, I think that's why having some of that data over a period of time will give us a better sense of what we should change and what's working. The employer mandate, as you said, was put off, but it's coming in 2015, and we've heard from New Hampshire businesses who are very worried about this. The administrative costs, the reporting requirements. As you know, the mandate is deeply unpopular with national business groups. When you start listening to New Hampshire businesses on this, uh, Senator Shaheen, could their concerns lead to more changes in this law? I, absolutely. I think we're going to hear from um, a variety of interests about changes that we may or may not need to put in place. And I appreciate that there's a lot of uncertainty, and that uncertainty creates concern. And we hear that people aren't hiring businesses. because they're uncertain about this. We do, although to what extent that's been documented, we haven't seen yet. So um, any, any delay in hiring, I think, is a concern. But what we're also seeing is that we've got four new carriers coming into the exchange next year. Um, I think that competition will help with rates. Um, again, they haven't released the rates for the upcoming year, but I would think with four new carriers that would be helpful. And so, as I said, with any big change, we have to see 
um, what works and what doesn't work. And I think what we need is we need to get those critics, you know, my opponent and others who have said the answer is to repeal the law, we need to get them to work with us to try and fix what's not working. Because unfortunately, all we've heard from the critics is let's repeal the law. We haven't heard an alternative. And as I talk to people in New Hampshire, I don't hear anybody who wants to go back to a time where insurance companies could deny people health care because of a pre-existing condition, where they could cut off your health care once you'd reached your limits for the year, where you, your children couldn't stay on your health insurance to age 26, where you didn't get help with your prescription drug coverage if you were in the donut hole, where you didn't have those um, preventive measures that are covered under the health care law. So um, are there things that we need to fix? Absolutely. And let's work together and fix them. One of the biggest lines from this whole Affordable Care Act debate that went on for many years uh, has come back to haunt Democrats this election season. The president's promise to Americans, you can keep your doctor. Now, as we've seen, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. There have been a lot of changes. Why did you and the President, Senator Shaheen, tell Americans that that would be the case, that they could keep their doctor? I think nobody anticipated the extent to which there was churn in the individual health insurance market and that insurance companies would go ahead and throw people off even though they knew the marketplace was coming. So I think fortunately, um, while I think there were people who did lose their doctors and that was very unfortunate, um, I think now most folks are back into a health insurance plan. Again, we know that there are four more carriers coming in next year into the market and that all of the hospitals in New Hampshire will be in at least three of those plans. So everyone should have the option of staying with the hospital and the doctor that they want to. Did the White House um, lead you down a wrong path there, giving you and other Democrats that line? Tell people this, you know, it'll reassure them. I think most people who have worked on this new law have done it with the best of intentions, with trying to find something that would work, um, that would work for the most people, so that people can have access to quality, affordable health care. Here in New Hampshire, we have almost 100,000 people who are now going to be able to get health care. And thanks to the, the bipartisan plan that passed the state legislature, we have almost 50,000 people who have access to Medicaid. We have 40,000 people who are in the marketplace who, um, when the goal was only about 20,000, we have more than twice. We have one of the highest percentages of enrollment in our state marketplace. And what Anthem has said is that about 80% of those people did not have a plan with Anthem before that. Now. Many of them probably had another plan, but there are a lot of people who now have access to health insurance who did not. And again, the opponents of the plan, their only answer is to repeal it. They want to throw tens of thousands of people off of their health care, and they want to give us years of uncertainty, again, about how we're going to address health care. You know, this is an issue that I worked really hard on. The six years that I was in the state Senate, the six years that I was governor, we brought the children's health insurance program to New Hampshire. When the legislature wouldn't support it, we got the foundation created by Matthew Thornton's um, being bought out to I provide the that. matching funds so that. we could get it started. And, and by the next budget cycle, it was so popular that the legislature adopted it. So Again, we're seeing things that need to be fixed, but throwing the baby out with the bathwater, I think, is not the answer. All right. Well, and if people want to hear Scott Brown's approach toward health care, we did talk about that in detail last week with him. So, again, all these forms are online, nhpr.org, along with the schedule of the upcoming forms. Let's turn to student debt, Senator Shaheen, a big issue here in the Granite State. This person says they didn't give their name, but uh, they're here in our audience. Since we are at the law school and many of us have taken on a lot of debt for education, can you please tell us the difference between you and your opponent in terms of combating the student debt crisis? Thank you for the question. It's a very good question and a very big challenge that we face, not just in New Hampshire, but across the country. Here in New Hampshire, we have the second highest student loan debt in the country. $33,000 on average per student. Um, and it's really affecting students' ability to 
do what they want when they get out of college. It's affecting their ability to get married, to buy homes, to buy cars, whatever they're trying to do. You know, I, I visited a young man at Walter Reed a couple of years ago who had lost a leg in Afghanistan from an IED. That's the military hospital. That's the military hospital. And when I went in, you know, we were talking about his recovery. And what I was really surprised about was that he wasn't so much worried about his recovery from losing his leg. What he and his wife were worried about was how were they going to pay their student loans off. Um, so this is a huge issue, and we've got to address it. I've tried to do several things and have voted to increase Pell Grants because that's one way that we can help young people with the cost of college. Uh, I've worked to change the student loan program in Washington so that we could save about $68 billion for students. But I think we've got to allow students to refinance their student loans. You can refinance your car, you can refinance your mortgage, but you can't refinance your student loans. Well, and I and did, yeah. we need to address that. I did read about the bills that you've worked on, you know, including giving students more information about their loans, capping payments at 10% of income. Here's my question, though, Senator Shaheen. Loans aside, what steps might the federal government take to urge colleges, to nudge colleges, uh, push colleges to lower the sticker price so students wouldn't have to take out so many loans in the first place. I mean, there is some analysis out there that says all these loans are just allowing colleges to jack up the price because students don't feel the pain immediately. Well, I do think colleges need to look at the cost of higher education. We're seeing, I, I certainly supported Governor Hassan in her efforts to uh, work with the Board of Trustees of the university system here so that they didn't raise tuition this year or last year. You know, as governor, I worked to address the cost of college here. We increased funding for the university system, but more than that, we worked with the community colleges and the university system to put in place agreements that would make sure that young people who started out at community, our community technical colleges, which are not as expensive, could transfer all of those credits into the university system without having to go another year or two. And that helped with reducing the cost of education. Sure, but in terms of federal pushes, either from you in Congress or from the White House, for example, President Obama has talked about tying federal support to visible efforts to lower the price, something that made a lot of college administrators go, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, but what do you think about that? I mean, is this a good idea to make institutions more accountable for keeping costs down? Sure, I think we ought to look at whatever might work. And that's, that's one idea. Your opponent, Scott Brown, also had a suggestion when he was here just the other night. He said, uh, let's examine the idea of taxing the endowments of major universities to incentivize spending on student financial assistance, the idea being some of these universities. I'm not suggesting UNH uh, law, so don't get mad at me here. But, but some of these universities do have giant endowments. And I think what he's pointing out is, look, uh, you know, maybe they could use some of that money to help students out. Well, what his proposal would do is tax foundations over a billion dollars. Here in New Hampshire, we only have one university that has over an endowment over a billion dollars. That'd be Dartmouth, so, right? That's Dartmouth. So, you know, I'm open to that as an option, but that's not really going to address the fundamental cost of student loans and the cost of higher education. So I, I think we've got to be realistic about what that cost is and think about what more we can do to address it. And, you know, again, I have a proposal that I've introduced with Elizabeth Warren and with others in the Senate to try and refinance student loans because right now I think that's a real crisis point. We have um, more student loan debt in this country than we have credit card debt. Here's another question that came earlier, uh, an email that came from one of our listeners, Barry. She says, I have read that while Senator Kelly Ayotte has had about 10 town hall meetings so far this year, Senator Jean Shaheen has not had any in the last two years. And uh, by the way, Senator Shaheen, the state GOP actually today continued criticizing you for not participating in the Nashua and Manchester chamber debates. So Barry and the state GOP seem to be saying there's a pattern of you avoiding public events. Well, they've been making that charge, but you know, the reality is I've spent the last 18 years traveling around New Hampshire listening to people in this state talking about the issues that they care about, um, and I've continued to do that throughout this campaign. You know, 
last year I had a televised town hall meeting at Channel 9, which I'm the only candidate who's done that. Um, I've agreed to four debates in this election, three televised. We're going to have four debates over the next five weeks. Um, I am going to do the joint appearance with the Nashua and Manchester Chamber, which is what they asked me to do. So I, I think that's an effort by Scott Brown and his supporters to try and divert people's attention from the issues that people in New Hampshire are concerned about because he doesn't want to talk about what his record has been on supporting corporate special interests. He doesn't want to talk about what his record has been on supporting middle class families. He doesn't want to talk about his support for over $20 billion in subsidies to the five biggest oil companies. And so that's, they're doing everything they can to divert attention from what his record was when he was in the United States Senate representing Massachusetts. And we talked with him about uh, some of those issues when we talked with him last week. So just to clarify, you are doing the Nashua Manchester Chamber event, but one-on-one, -on -one, not a it's debate It's my format? understanding that that's what they ask us to do. Okay. Well, we'll have to clarify that. Um, because I got a call from them today saying something else. But we're going to move on from that issue and go to another uh, question from our audience. Here's one. Again, this person didn't give their name, and you don't have to. Um, are you committed to campaign finance reform? And if so, in your opinion, what is the best way to fund campaigns? Wow, this is a huge, huge issue. Thank you for the question. It is, and it's an issue that's really impacting our democracy, I think. Um, you know, because of the Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United, um, they have now said that corporations can spend an unlimited amount of money in campaigns, as can individuals. And we're seeing that here in New Hampshire, where we have third party groups coming in, um, spending literally millions and millions of dollars. And they're groups that don't have ties to New Hampshire, and they don't care how what they say in any of their advertisements. I think at this point, we need to do a couple of things. In order to overturn the Supreme Court decision, it would take a constitutional amendment, as I understand. That's a tall order. Um, it is a tall order, although there's legislation that would put that process in place so that if we passed it in Washington, each state would then have to take it up. I'm a co-sponsor of that amendment. But I also have co-sponsored something called the Disclose Act, which would require any person or entity that's spending more than $10,000 on a campaign, a political campaign of any kind, to have to say who they are and what their connections are so that the public would know who's spending money and what interests they have in spending that money. Sometimes the disclosure is a concern. People don't want retribution um, to their companies, to their lives, well, listen, and so forth. if you're going to spend millions of dollars, then you should stand up and tell people why you're spending it. I want to know why the Koch brothers are here um, spending millions of dollars. I want to know why ending spending um, is here spending millions of dollars. And i got to cut you off there, Senator Shaheen. We'll be back in just a moment. This is The Exchange on NHPR. This is The Exchange on NHPR. I'm Laura Kanoy. Welcome back to our campaign series of Rudman Center Conversations with the Candidates at UNH School of Law. <laughs> our candidate is New Hampshire U.S. Senator Jean Shaheen, a Democrat running for re-election. And Senator Shaheen, let's talk about financial reform, specifically Wall Street. Six years ago, I remember when you were running for election, uh, the Wall Street meltdown was about to kick off a recession. It seems, seems amazing to look back, and here we are. Now some analysts worry about another crisis brewing and that we're missing the signs, just like we did before. How satisfied are you, Senator Shaheen, that we've done enough in terms of financial sector regulation that we won't see banks too big to fail again? Well, I think there's more that we can do. I was um, one of nine Democrats who voted against um, funding TARP, which was the bank bailout when I got to Washington because I didn't think there was enough transparency or accountability with what we were asking from the big banks. I did vote for the Dodd-Frank reform um, and for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau because I thought they were important to do. Um, I've been disappointed that Eric Holder, as Attorney General, didn't 
um, bring any action against the people who were responsible for the financial crisis. I think that sent a very bad message to um, people who might be um, less responsible than they should be in the future on this issue. Um, we've seen the stock exchange come back dramatically. We've seen unemployment lowered. Um, we've seen that most of our big corporations are doing very well. But I think we're still seeing families who are struggling. Um, we're still seeing small businesses who are doing better, but are still concerned about what the future holds. And that's a difference between me and my opponent, because I think we need to be looking at how we support small businesses so that they can grow. Two thirds of job creation comes from small businesses. I think we need to be looking at our tax code and seeing where we can um, make changes to some of the loopholes in the tax code that um, are disincentives to how we grow the economy here. And so I think there is more work to do, and I would hope that we can work together to do that. Well, what about the Dodd-Frank bill, which, as you said, you supported at the time, saying it would bring accountability and transparency we need to the financial sector, protect families and businesses from abusive practices, prevent taxpayers from having to bail out Wall Street, uh, which really rubbed a lot of people over the wrong way. Has Dodd-Frank been an effective tool or not, Senator Shaheen? Well, we're just seeing the impact from that. I mean, we don't have a lot of, a lot of data yet um, on what the impact from Dodd-Frank will be. You know, one of the things that I was disappointed in, and again, my opponent was one of the architects of giving away $19 billion to the big banks as part of that Wall Street reform when we were trying to, uh, to prevent taxpayers from having to pay that. Um, so I was on the side of saying, you know, we shouldn't provide those giveaways to the big banks. We should put in place the Volcker rule. Um, we should do more to ensure that we don't have this kind of financial meltdown in the future. But to what extent we've been successful, I, I don't think we know the answer to that yet, Laura. So if I were to ask you, what should we do to prevent another meltdown, you would say, we, have, we don't know yet. We don't know if the systems we put in place yet are strong enough. It's been a couple years, though. I'm it kind has. of surprised that we don't know yet if they're, if they're working. Um, there was something worrisome from the FDIC recently. Plans submitted by 11 of the country's biggest banks, quote, provide no credible or clear path through bankruptcy that doesn't require unrealistic assumptions and direct or indirect public support. So there's the FDIC saying, it looks a little dicey. Well... Again, I think we've got to watch it very carefully. We need to provide oversight. That's what Congress is supposed to be doing. So we need to be watching what happens. I want to ask you another question, Senator Shaheen, about gun control. After the Newtown shootings, Democrats, led by the president and vice president, vowed some kind of action. But at the federal level, very little has happened. There's been various laws passed in, in various states. Meanwhile, the FBI just recently said there's been a sharp rise in mass shootings since 2000. This is not including domestic violence and gang violence, by the way. Should this Newtown tragedy, Senator Shaheen, have been the impetus for change? You know, like most of New Hampshire, I support the Second Amendment. I think it's been very important to New Hampshire's tradition of sportsmen, um, our hunting tradition here, our sports tradition here. But I think... I think we've got to make sure that guns stay out of the hands of those who are mentally ill, out of the hands of um, felons. And I think that's where most responsible gun owners are. I was down in Derry 10 days or so ago at Derry Fest, and I was talking to a man who was asking me this question. And he said, you know, what are you going to do about the Second Amendment? He said, you know, I voted for you for governor. I said, well, and did I do anything when I was governor that you were concerned about? He said, no. I said, well, but I do think we need to keep guns out of the hands of those people who are not going to use them responsibly. And he said, oh, well, I agree with that. Um, but in order to do that, we've got to get some agreement in Washington. And sadly, there was not agreement to take some of the actions that were introduced in the Senate. 
what were some of those actions specifically? And, and did you support them, Senator Shaheen? I remember I President did. Obama saying, let's have a vote, but just remind us what that I, was. I voted for background checks. I thought that was important to do. And we had, you know, I think it's interesting to note with um, much of the legislation that we talk about, it gets over 50 votes, but because we have a filibuster rule in the Senate, which I think we should change, I think we need to reform the filibuster, um, legislation doesn't pass because it doesn't get 60 votes. Background checks was one of those. We had a strong vote, over 50, but it didn't get to the 60 votes. So I, I, as I said, I think we need to change um, the filibuster rules in the Senate because I don't think our forefathers ever envisioned that every vote should require 60 votes to get something done. Okay, so we're before uh, uh, an audience here at UNH Law, so I'm guessing people have some thoughts about the filibuster and possibly changing that. So just remind us, um, the filibuster right now says what? I mean, I know, but just remind us. And then how would you foresee changing it, Senator Sheen? That's a giant change. I mean, this is in the Constitution, isn't it? No. No. The, okay. No. This has just been practice, and, and actually it wasn't really an issue until fairly recently, uh, until President Obama got into office, that we really saw the number of filibusters increasing dramatically. And what I mean, Democrats filibustered President Bush, too, to be fair. They did. Um, and, and I actually think it should change regardless of who's in the majority and regardless of who the president is, because I don't think... Um, we should have every vote require 60 in order to get something done. And you can change it in a couple of ways. You can, you can either say, um, as has been a proposal, that the filibuster is upheld for a period of time, and then if you can't get agreement after that period of time, then you reduce the n number of votes required. So you go from 60 to, you know, in a month, if you have the same vote, it would take, I don't know, 58 votes. You can structure this in a variety of ways. You can also have something called a talking filibuster, which is something that I have supported, which says, you know, for those people who've seen Mr. Smith goes to Washington, you remember Jimmy Stewart on the floor of the Senate or the House talking about um, an issue until um, everybody finally agreed to it. Today, in order to filibuster, you don't have to go to the floor of the Senate and talk about whatever your concern is. Um, all you have to do is object, and that holds things up. You can also change it in a way that says, instead of 60 votes in order to keep something from passing, you have to have 40 votes to show up to prevent something from passing. Because one of the things that happens now is that people who don't want um, legislation don't have to show up. You only have to, you need 60 votes in order to move legislation. Well, if you had 40 votes in order to prevent legislation from moving, then those people who really objected would have to be there and have their vote counted. So there are a variety of ways to reform this. It's an arcane process, and it's one that I think we need to take a look at. In today's day and age, I don't think one vote um, should hold things up in the Senate any more than I think every vote should require 60 in order to get something done. I wonder how your fellow Democrats feel about the possibility of changing filibuster, the filibuster practice when you guys could be in the minority after this election. Well, there are people on both sides of the question, and I think that's true on both sides of the aisle. But again, my view is that the more transparent and the more accountable we are in Washington, the better in terms of the public. One more question about uh, Newtown. After the shooting, you know, again, some people call for gun control. You mentioned more background checks, uh, keeping guns out of the hands of, you said, felons and people with mental illness. Um, what about bans on certain types of weapons, Senator Shaheen? Did you think at the time, do you feel now, that that is also a way to go? I did vote for one of the bans on assault, certain assault weapons. Um, a ban that was passed back in 1994, and Judd Gregg voted for it when he was a senator, a similar kind of ban. Um, again, it didn't get 60 votes. 
And one more question on this. Uh, after this happened also, a lot of politicians, Senator Ayotte said, look, this isn't really about the guns. It's about strengthening our mental health system. What do you think about that, Senator Shaheen? Is the problem people just suddenly acting out for whatever reason? Um, or is it that it's just too easy to get a gun? What do you think? I think it's a complex problem, and it has a variety of um, elements to it. I think our mental health system is one of those elements. But I think background checks are another. So I think we've got to look at the problem from a variety of ways. I think we've had a number of recommendations, and we have to look and see which works. And one of the things that we know works is keeping guns out of the hands of those who shouldn't have them. And that's what background checks do. Here's another question from our audience. What do you suggest to secure the finances of Medicare for current and future generations? Thank you to the person who sent us this question. Well, Medicare is obviously very important um, to people 65 and older. Before we passed the Affordable Care Act, what I heard from a lot of people is they couldn't wait to turn 65 because they knew they would have health care. Fortunately, that no longer is that concern. But Medicare is very important, and it's been a very successful program. Um, one of the things that the Affordable Care Act did because of addressing the cost of providing health care is it has extended the life of Medicare by 13 years, which is very important. Um, I thought the Affordable but, Care Act made cuts in Medicare or reductions in Medicare spending to pay for the Affordable Care Act. Actually, that is um, an accusation that has been fact-checked by independent organizations, and um, factcheck.org has shown that to be false. So that is not the case. In fact, what the Affordable Care Act did was to extend the life of Medicare. Not a, redu not a, a cut, but a slowdown in Medicare spending. You're saying not the case at all? Um, the accusation that we cut billions of dollars from Medicare as part of the Affordable Care Act is not accurate. Here's another comment from our audience here. What do you say to young people who are on the fence or not enthusiastic about voting? Thank you for the question. Lots of law students here tonight. Our democracy only works if people vote, if people get involved. And this is a critical election where there are very big differences on issues between myself and my opponent. And whether it's how do we invest to create jobs in New Hampshire and in this country, are we going to invest, continue the, the kind of subsidies and loopholes for corporate interests, um, the loopholes that incentivize sending jobs overseas, which my opponent supports, and I think we need to close those loopholes, um, whether it's um, how you feel about women's access to reproductive choices. Um, again, I think women should make those decisions. My opponent has not been there to support women. He supported the something called the Blunt Amendment when he was in the Senate, which would say that any employer for any religious reason could deny um, access to contraceptive coverage or other health benefits. Um, Republicans have said that's about religious liberty, freedom. Employers shouldn't be forced to pay well, for something they find morally. It begs the question repugnant. of whether employees should be forced to adopt their employer's religious freedom. And in fact, um, the Affordable Care Act has made provisions that provide exemptions for religious concerns. So, so, so I, I think that's a red herring. But, but I'm not finished, because the final pe thing I wanted to raise that I think a lot of young people are concerned about is what's happening with the environment, what's happening with climate change. And again, there's a very big difference between my opponent, who says human activity doesn't contribute to climate change, and my position, which is we've got to address climate change. So there is a lot at stake in this election, and you only have a voice in this democracy if you vote. So that's the answer to this question. If people are feeling unenthusiastic, you're saying big choices. By the way, Senator Brown did say when he was with us at, on the climate change, he feels like it's man-made part, and there could be other other factors. But I have another question about young people. Um, and here's my last question for you, Senator Shaheen. To a young person, and there's a lot of law students in the audience, and as we all know, 
lawyers often go into politics to a young person considering a career in I'm politics. Not a lawyer, I'm in politics. <laughs> and you know, just given the tone, given the sums of money that you have to involve, given some of the nastiness that we've seen in in this campaign, what would you say to that young person sitting out there who says, you know, I'd like to get into politics, I'd like to make a difference, but yuck. <laughs> Well, I would say that's all the more reason to get involved because you can make a difference and that's the way to do it. Get involved, make a change. You know, this country, you're the people who are going to inherit this country. And if you don't get involved, then who is? You know, I used to always like the saying that children are 80, 20 percent of our population, but they're 80 percent of, they're 100 percent of our future getting my quote correct here. <laughs> um, and I think that's true about the next generation. Your involvement is what's going to change the world. And I have no doubt that you can do that. You know, one of my favorite quotes is Margaret Mead's that is, you know, never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. And when young people get involved, they can change the world. And so I would say to all of you thinking about it, here, here, come down, volunteer. We'll put you to work. We need your help. Um, <laughs> all right, Senator Sheen, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for being with us. We really it's appreciate it. It's great to it. be here. Thank you. Our next forum is with Republican congressional candidate Frank Ginta. You can go to NHPR.org and find out more. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight, especially to the team at NHPR and UNH Law. Again, to you, Senator Shaheen, for being with us. Thank you. Nice this is The Exchange on NHPR. <laughs>